So welcome, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Um, my name is Riley Hardigan. I'm joined today by my colleagues Meredith Crawford and Laurie Toth. And we're here to talk a little bit about <coughs> JIRA and Confluence, and how at the Yale School of Management, we use that beyond IT, and for things that are not technical, so non-traditional uses of JIRA and Confluence. Perfect. Much better. So before we begin, I just want to kind of gauge who's in the audience. So if you have used JIRA or Confluence before, go ahead and raise your hand, shout at me. OK, so perfect. Um, how about the other questions? Do any of these apply to you? You you know, haven't been able to find an email when you've needed to like get some information. Um, you feel like you have an ever-growing to-do list. And finally, since we're in New Haven, how many of you like pizza? Yes, OK, awesome, awesome. Round of applause for New Haven Pizza. So pizza comes in later at a really embarrassing uh, thing to admit. But, uh, so if you're not awake by now, you might be in about three minutes. So what we're going to cover today, congratulations, you're in the right session. We are going to cover, first, I'll take on what exactly these tools are. Then I will hand over the presentation to my colleagues, Meredith and Lori. We'll talk a bit about why we use these tools and how we use them day to day at the Yale School of Management. And finally, I'll be joining you again to give some advice. If any of this um, you know, inspires you, you want to go ahead and give this a shot, give you some advice and tips um, from what we learned. So without further ado, let's dig in. Literally, pizza. Um, and this is where the funny story comes in. So a lot of you are probably familiar with this, like, pizza analogy um, to describe workflows. And we use this a lot. Um, people use this a lot. So I'm going to use it again. So bear with me if you've heard it before. Um, but we're going to imagine that we're all running a pizzeria. Okay? And we have to do a certain amount of things to get a pizza from someone ordering it to getting that pizza out the door. Right? So we're going to build a basic pizza tracker. And that's just going to consist of someone places an order, it's prepped. So there's a customer, one of you places it in order, one of you is putting the toppings on that pizza, one of you puts it in the oven, the other checks that it's good, puts it in the box, someone delivers it, and someone's lucky enough to enjoy that pizza. And now that we have this beautiful pizza tracker, we can see we're doing pretty well at our pizzeria, right? We can see we're getting a lot of orders. So some people are really picky, do the half of this, half of that, which is to be simple. And as things are going on, we see an issue. And we're able to only see this issue because we built this pizza tracker. And here we have our customer saying, yo, where's my pizza? And we have the manager saying, what's going on? And thankfully, because we've built this pizza tracker, we can see maybe where the issue is. So there are no pizzas in the oven. It's probably a problem. Um, because it means we have no pizzas in boxes, which means we have no pizzas for our really sad customer over here. And now comes for the real, really embarrassing part that I mentioned earlier. Um, I was in an internal meeting, and I was like, let me use a pizza analogy to describe you know, a basic a workflow, because we're in New Haven, we can all relate. <coughs> so my hand shot off, and I said, it's just like a Domino's pizza tracker, um, which immediately I was laughed at as lived in New Haven for four years, and I still sometimes order Tomos. So um, if you recognize that piece of workflow, it looks a lot like <coughs> this. So keep that in mind, so I'll come back later. But basically, to come full circle, I'm in con. Yeah. You're just not picking up. I think batteries have died. Can you hear me now? 
Perfect. All right, so to come full circle, what are JIRA and Confluence? JIRA is basically a pizza tracker. So we can see a basic workflow in JIRA to do in progress and done. And we just built a custom workflow for a non-traditional use of JIRA with our pizza tracker. We have order placed, our in-progress statuses with prep, baking, box, up for delivery, and then finally a resolution of done. And I'm using some of these words because, again, a lot of you are familiar with JIRA and Confluence. So now that um, we've gone through that, we can finally come full circle and explain the analogy. So in this story of our pizzeria, JIRA is really the pizza tracker. It's tracking those items along that workflow. JIRA service desk is kind of embarrassingly, again, like that Domino's pizza tracker. It's really where the customer is seeing, you know, where's my pizza? How long is it going to take to get to me? What's the status of that pizza? And, fi and finally, um, Confluence is a place where we can all collaborate, write pizza recipes, write guidelines about how we work. And finally, a pizza can be anything that you'd like in JIRA. So to talk about those any things in JIRA, I'm going to hand it over now to my colleague, uh, Meredith, who's going to talk a little bit about um, what those things are at the Yale School of Management. Thanks. Thanks, Riley. Hi, I'm Meredith Crawford. Um, I handle editorial workflow um, for the communications department at SOM. And um, advance a slide here. Um, some of you might recognize this as a basic uh, sc screenshot of a base camp. Um, before we found JIRA and Confluence as a workflow solution, we were using Basecamp, um, which I think a lot of editorial teams probably do. And we were using it to manage our communications projects, which at any given time we probably have dozens of. Um, and they range in complexity. So some of them are really straightforward. They don't require a lot of, um, you know, a lot of a complicated workflow. They just go from to do, to in progress, to done. But some of them have a lot of different assets, a lot of stakeholders, a lot of creators. Um, and, and also, we have a built-in process where we need to send our content out to external, um, external stakeholders for approval. So in addition to that, we also have a post-publish. So once our work is published, we also have a, another workflow to consider, and that's how to promote our content on social, and maybe how to create something on the website to feature it more prominently. Um, and when we were doing all of these things in Basecamp, we were really limited um, when it came to differentiating the various tasks within one project. Um, everything had to be under one umbrella. And so we would end up with these huge threads that sometimes went on for months at a time. Um, and I mean, you can see at the top of here we have 3,580 3, discussions. So you'd have to mine your way through that. And then when you were working on a project, um, say you were looking for a specific asset, like a video, you would have to go through the thread and, you know, God forbid you pulled the wrong video, not the most updated Word document. So it was really confusing. And we quickly realized that it would be great if we could find um, a workflow solution that gave us a 360 degree view of our projects a place where we could keep everything under one umbrella, but also take into account that all of the various tasks and assets probably had their own like sort of workflow um, to take into account. So this is where JIRA came into play. Um, and this is just the ba very, very bare bones, basic, sort of baked in JIRA um, workflow that, that everybody has access to, really. And that is just, you know, gives you a, a very simplified workflow to do in progress and done. So we started with this, and we realized pretty quickly that we had almost limitless options in terms of um, customizing our workflow process for um, all of our needs, which is great, but it's also a little daunting. So we spent a lot of time really um, dialing in and trying to figure out um, what we needed, what we didn't need. And eventually, for the editorial side, we came up with this. And you'll see it still includes some of the very basic, um, very basic statuses that you would get in a simplified workflow, like open, um, you know, the project is, hasn't been started, assigned, it's in draft mode, 
Um, we have, when we're working on something, we need it to be sent out for external approval to a stakeholder. So that's a status that we decided we needed. Um, and then, you know, ready to be put into the CMS, um, published and done. So this has worked really well for us. Um, and it allows us to take into account every point um, that we move content through and to bring it from creation to um, completion. And this also allows us to include um, post-publishing concerns like social media promotion. Um, and the best part is that when we create a ticket to begin working on a project, um, we can incorporate all the elements that go along with it. So just by adding subtasks, we can consider various assets, like uh, if it has a video, if it has um, photos that we need, um, you know, if we need to promote it on social, um, that kind of thing. And everything is kept in one place, which is great. And in terms of keeping it all organized, this is probably my favorite thing about JIRA. This is, so this is a Kanban. I don't know how many people are familiar with that. Um, if you're not familiar with JIRA, it's, I like to think of it as I'm a very non-technical person. So I like to think of it as just kind of a blackboard where everything gets aggregated. Um, and you can really, can really keep it organized by creating these quick filters, which are um, when you label content, you can then dial in and search by the quick filter. And you can see that everything is in its own column. So we have stuff that's still waiting to be done. Um, we have stuff that's in progress. Someone's reviewing it. Someone's working on writing it. Um, we have stuff that's out for approval. We have stuff that's ready for CMS. And then we have stuff that's published. And um, what you don't see on that is there are also some, some other customizable um, tasks within that that say whether or not it's ready for social or if it has been promoted on social or not. So we've really, really um, gotten pretty granular with that customization. Um, my favorite thing about the quick filters is that you can click on any of them and it will just give you the relevant content. So I was in a meeting with um, our MBA for executives colleagues the other day, and we were talking about content that was going to go into their newsletter. And they said, what, have you, what do you guys have in progress or that you've recently published that we can use in the newsletter? And I said, oh, give me a second. And I just clicked on the EMBA content label, and it gives me every single thing that has been published. And it tells you exactly what status it's in. So you know, is it, is it out for approval? Has it just been published? Have we promoted it on social? So, that's all really great. Um, I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn things over to our colleague, Lori, who's going to talk a little bit about how we use Confluence. Okay. So I'm going to talk about how and why we use Confluence. We discovered early on that Confluence is a great place for content planning and storing meeting notes, and we also soon discovered it's a great place to collaborate. Within the past year, we started to rely on Confluence for content planning. It's an easy place for multiple people from teams across Yale SOM to collaborate on one planning document. It also helps with organization because we can keep all the notes and discussions in one area that everyone can access instead of in someone's email, which might get lost or forgotten, at least in my email. <laughs> it also makes it easy to keep historical records. This helps if your area runs on cycles like ours with a few key events like commencement or conferences that happen each year. By organizing and keeping our notes, we can look back on what we did the previous year, determine if it worked well, and then plan for the current year. Now, speaking of planning, we tend to do a lot of that. For social media, we use a planning document, which helps us track what's shareable and when we plan to share it. Each Monday, our social team meets to discuss the week ahead. Since we use Hootsuite to schedule content, we can decide what makes sense to post on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and then schedule it. Once an item is scheduled, we can tick off the box to indicate that it's done. We also have a section where we keep track of items that are ready to share. It's been extremely helpful to keep these lists to remind us of news stories, blogs, or even media mentions of faculty that we haven't shared yet. 
we found that we are able to be more thoughtful on posts by being proactive and planning rather than being reactive. So as I mentioned, we use Confluence a lot for editorial planning. From social to newsletters to publications, it makes it easier to communicate and collaborate with multiple teams. It also helps increase the transparency of a project and pretty much what our team is working on. Each month, the communications team helps send four individual newsletters for different admissions teams. Once we added this calendar to Confluence, it helped everyone realize that their project is just one of many that we're working on concurrently. It also helps us plan deadlines and hopefully keeps the newsletter spaced apart so that we're not in newsletter planning overload at any one time of the month. Whoopsie. <laughs> so this is our newsletter planning document that Meredith referenced. So when we meet with the admissions teams, we use this document to plan the content for the month. By using a template, it helps organize the planning process. Once the content is laid out, we can track the progress of the stories. Many already have JIRA tickets, but anything that's unique content for the newsletter, we will create a JIRA ticket. Now we can keep track of when an item is submitted for review and where it is in the approval process. In this example alone, in that last column of notes, you can see we have some items that are published, done, editing, or in progress. <laughs> I'm very heavy handed in this. You can also prompt milestones like we did for the newsletters. Once a check is performed, we can tick the box. For newsletters, it serves as a reminder of the steps that need to be taken before the newsletter can be sent. So this is a look, just briefly, of our collaboration space. You can see we use it for print publications and alumni webinars to website edits and analytics. We chose to keep our collaborations in one project, but you can break them out into separate projects so that only a certain team can collaborate in that space if that works better for you. So this has just been a quick run through of how and why we use Confluence. I am going to send it back to Riley for some tips. Great, thank you, Lori. Make sure my mic is on. It looks on. All right, thank you, Lori. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up. We've taken a few bites out of this presentation. Sorry, I'm being a little cheesy. Um, but now I'm gonna go ahead and thank you. Um, give some advice for teams wanting to do the same. Um, you know, want to go in and use Jira and Confluence for these non-technical uses, or you know, really beyond IT. And the first and foremost um, piece of advice I can give you is to keep it simple, especially to start. And what that means are those workflows that you saw that Meredith presented, that first one that said to do, in progress, done, and that all of the statuses can transition to that status. That's what keeping it simple means. Get the folks who are gonna be using this um, uh, habituated to using the tool with a simple workflow that's open for those of you who speak Jira. And I would also keep in mind, you know, think about their use case. Think about how you're going to provide value for that person to use um, and to adopt Confluence and Jira. How is it going to make their job easier? I think that's something um, that we learned along the way. Next is, of course, do the legwork. And this can mean many things. Um, this could mean you know, doing the legwork to get buy-in from leadership. And a great way to do that is go to Atlassian's website, sign up for a trial, build a workflow, show what's possible. Um, and then once you do that, instead of just, you know, hey, we should do this, if you build it and people really see what's possible, they kind of start to buy in a little bit more. And next, find champions. And this could be people from around the school, um, around the university, outside the university. Um, so really anyone who's going to go ahead and jump into JIRA, jump into Confluence and into these tools with you. Um, and I must say, you yourself, if you are driving adoption of this tool, you need to take that first jump. Um, you need to be transparent. You need to just go in and start using it. Um, start doing your work there and people will follow, um, especially when they start to see some of the benefits that you might know and want to communicate to your team. 
And again, make sure it's the right solution for your team. Um, this was a great solution for us because, of course, these Atlassian tools have a large footprint already at the Yale School of Management. Um, we're already using them. Um, we have licenses, so hey, why not use it for non-traditional or non-IT uses? Um, Atlassian themselves actually do this. Um, so really, it just made sense. And it almost became like a lingua franca between you know, our users, our folks in my department, the folks um, who support us, and our developers. We could all kind of speak this common language of Jira. And finally, remember that no tool is going to solve all your problems. Um, you know, the tool is only as strong as those underlying principles kind of undergirding it. So remember that, you know, this tool isn't to replace conversation face-to-face -face, or conversations or communication in any other manner. Um, and no matter how cool or flashy or what kind of automations you can do, again, keep it simple to start with. Don't overwhelm folks, including yourself if you're driving adoption. And again, really remember this last point. Um, and with that, uh, we are ready for questions, which I'm sure you might have a lot of. Um, so, And the first answer, that is Handsome Dan in the Evans Hall courtyard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.